greeting everyone. Thank you for joining us today for the virtual virtual opening reception of Particle and Wave Paper Clay Illuminated. I'm Sage Rousseau, Director of Education at Fuller Craft Museum in Brockton, Massachusetts. Our mission at Fuller Craft is to provide meaningful discovery of contemporary craft through exhibitions, collections, education, and public programs. We are committed to challenging perceptions and building appreciation of the material world. And our purpose is to inspire, stimulate, and enrich an ever-expanding community. We'll start as we're about to do tonight. Uh, I'm really excited to have you all here. We're uh, to learn more about our collections, exhibitions, and other upcoming virtual events, or to become a member, please visit us at fullercraft.org. Joining me tonight is Chief Curator of Fuller Craft Museum, Beth McLaughlin, who will start the event tonight by introducing you to the exhibition and our special guests. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the reception for Particle and Wave, Paper Clay Illuminated. Um, I so wish that we could all be together in the gallery celebrating this extraordinary exhibition, um, but I assure you that it looks spectacular in person, and I certainly take comfort in the fact that in the Zoom world that we're living in, we can still all get together and we're even welcoming artists and guests from around the world to this event. So that, that makes me very happy. So thank you all for coming. Um, and I also wanted to mention that we have a virtual tour of the exhibition that we just went live with today. And I believe Sage is gonna put the link to that in the chat. Um, it was our first uh, virtual tour that we put together using the Matterport uh, platform. And I think it looks really fantastic. And, um, you know, it's not, not quite the same as being there, but it comes pretty close. So I hope everyone will take some time to look through the tour. And the exhibition, as I mentioned, is just so superb. I first heard about Particle and Wave from former Fuller Craft Museum director Gretchen Keyworth, who sent me an email and said, oh my gosh, you have to learn about this show that Lori Nelson and Peter Held are working on. And, um, you know, was kind of hooked right from the beginning. At Fuller Craft uh, Museum, we are charged with showcasing the full range of contemporary craft. And that includes works that are very deeply rooted in tradition to objects that are on the cutting edge. And Particle and Wave, in my opinion, really hits on both cylinders. And it does so simply in a very beautiful way. Um, the use, and I'm sure Peter and Lori will talk more about this, but the use of paper and ceramics dates back centuries. Um, and the artists in this exhibition are really using the medium in innovative and unexpected and mind-blowing ways, as you'll see. Um, and I'm just so thrilled that Gretchen clued me into it all those years ago. I also wanted to express gratitude to Lori Nelson, who's with us here tonight, exhibition director and organizer, um, for her stalwart efforts in organizing the show and helping to bring it to Fuller Craft. I'd also like to applaud Peter Held for his brilliant curation of the exhibition and for uniting the 45 artists so beautifully. I'm thrilled that we have both of them here today and um, first, we're going to hear from Lori, who will um, tell us more about the process of putting the exhibition together, and then she will introduce Peter. Lori Nelson is the, as I mentioned, the director and organizer of Particle and Wave. Throughout Lori's career, she has succeeded in numerous roles, including as an artist working in the mediums of collage, bricolage, textile, and ceramics. Um, but it doesn't end there. Lori is also a vocalist, an actress, an activist, a theatrical director, a writer, a teacher, a scientist, a database specialist, and grandmother to six children, and an avid ceramics collector. And I don't believe she ever sleeps. That's just <laughs> amazing. Um, and we're thrilled to have both Lori and Peter here today. So welcome, and I'll let you take it away. And I'm so excited to be here with you tonight. Um, I think it's fitting that the particle and wave finale is at the Fuller Craft Museum, as they were the first to recognize the importance of this exhibition. And as Beth mentioned, uh, also Gretchen Keyworth, uh, who we met quite a few years ago, back in 2015, uh, at a <clears throat> workshop at Harvard. So I'm grateful to the Fuller, first of all, for their perseverance 
during this difficult year. I think the installation is beautiful. And the mission of Particle and Wave was not only to bring together an international community of artists to show the diversity of work being produced with this particular medium and the boundaries that can be stretched, but also to inspire many people, as, as many people as possible, to be creative in their own lives through the work being presented today. The Fuller's use of virtual technology for this exhibition, excellently photographed by David Koff, has made it possible to reach that broader worldwide audience. I also, there were a lot of players that made this exhibition happen. And I'm sure that they will talk a little bit tonight about their own work. And uh, so I really want to take this time to acknowledge them. So I'm grateful to the artists, Jerry Bennett, Graham Hay, Rebecca Hutchinson, Anjani Kana, and Angela Malore for providing support and their own unique perspective during the early planning stages of this exhibition. Also to Rosette Galt for her support and providing valuable historical information for our paper clay timeline that is uh, displayed uh, in the exhibition hall. Also to specifically to Jerry Graham and Rebecca who held workshops to raise funds for this project, also donating a portion of their stipends to the project to get it, uh, to bring some life to it, to bootstrap some funds, um, which enabled us to hire Peter uh, to come on board and, and take us to the finale. <laughs> um, but also with those workshops, um, I have to acknowledge uh, Kathy King at Harvard, the Clay Studio, and New Moo Studio at Fernwood Farms for all the work they did to organize these workshops. Next, uh, I wanna thank the Jeffrey Span Gallery, Laguna Clay, Rosette Galt, and Gretchen Keyworth for their donations uh, to this project also to Red Light Art here in Denver, Colorado for their fiscal sponsorship and to the Caroline R. Gray Boys Foundation who made this particular exhibition possible for the Fuller Craft Museum. Peter Held, mm. in addition to his contribution as curator of ceramics at the ASU Art Museum, Peter has curated over a hundred exhibitions, including seven national traveling exhibitions. He is both author and editor for several books and articles. Peter, I have learned so much from you and you made this exhibition a reality. It is my great pleasure to introduce Peter Held, author, creator, and builder of relationships and communities. Peter? Thanks, Lori. Welcome, everybody. It's uh, great to see so many familiar faces as well as new ones. So, uh, Lori, I want to thank you too, because you were the prime mover to keep us all moving forward and uh, creating an open dialogue. Uh, throughout the planning of the exhibition. So uh, the idea for the exhibition, Lori had about a decade ago. And in the ensuing years, a core group of artists uh, that Lori mentioned, our advisory committee, uh, we met on almost a monthly basis over two years uh, to strategize the best way to uh, see this exhibition to fruition. Uh, so, uh, as a background, uh, I myself, have, I'm trained as a ceramic artist, have an undergraduate degree in studio arts, former resident uh, artist at the Archie Bray Foundation in the 1970s, 
and was a practicing artist for about 10 years, but then got involved in the museum world and became more fascinated with working with objects and how uh, the manner in which objects or groups could tell different stories. Uh, so, uh, you know, as someone that's been involved in the ceramic field for 40 plus years, I'm only 39, but I can't figure out the math there. Uh, you know, I was honored to help the group uh, curate the exhibition. So with any exhibition, especially a traveling exhibition, there are certain limitations and parameters to deal with. Uh, first is, you know, the vision of the exhibition was always to be international in stature uh, and representation. Uh, we wanted a variety of approaches uh, to artists using paper clay, uh, whether it was vessel oriented uh, or sculptural in nature. Uh, but with the traveling show, uh, there were limitations. So one was size, uh, you know, it's uh, a major chore to crate and ship uh, fragile ceramics uh, all over the country, but uh, we managed to do it with very few mishaps. Uh, also, some of the ways I think about approaching uh, curating a show of this nature uh, is to represent uh, different styles, uh, artists' intentions, uh, conceptual ideas that are imbued in the work. So uh, it started out, uh, our conversation was that we were going to invite approximately 25 artists to submit two works each. And over the course of planning, we decided to open it up and have a open uh, juried selection as well. And we received approximately 100 works uh, from artists all over the world. Uh, to look at. Uh, <clears throat> just stepping back, you know, as a, someone involved in the ceramic field, I certainly heard of paper clay. I really didn't know how it was made. Uh, my focus as a curator when I was at ASU was based uh, more on uh, uh, the visual and aesthetic value of uh, ceramic arts uh, and less so with technique. Uh, but I felt like I had to learn something with this show because it was based on a specific type of material. Uh, so I did learn uh, quite a bit about paper clay. So the advisory committee suggested scores of names to consider, you know, I would Google searched them, look at their work, uh, other artists I emailed. Uh, so that process of getting to the final selection was almost two years. And uh, as Beth has mentioned and Lori, uh, we were very pleased with the uh, results of the show. Uh, you know, when I first looked at the work, uh, originally it looked like a lot of the artists working with paper clay used it primarily uh, unglazed and mostly with porcelain. So a lot of the work was uh, uh, white and palette. And uh, I really wanted to expand uh, that part of the show to have more coloration with the work. Uh, but after the final selections were made, uh, you know, I noticed a number of uh, themes uh, that a lot of artists were uh, dealing with. Uh, so one was figuration. And we have a number of great examples of uh, figurative work in the exhibition. Uh, off the top of my head, uh, there's Christina Cordova, uh, Razi Jean. Uh, on Johnny uh, Kana, uh, and mine, mine is slipping others. Uh, 
and some are more uh, realistic in nature and others are more abstracted. And it was interesting that uh, looking at the group in total, uh, a number of the artists are more dealing with uh, uh, more introspective, self-referential uh, aspects of their life that come through their work and others dealing with more uh, universal themes. So besides uh, the figurative work, I noticed uh, several of the artists worked in a grid or structural or uh, architectural framework uh, to their work. Uh, and the other themes I'm trying to think right now because it's been a couple of years, I'm trying to refresh my memory. Uh, was uh, organic abstraction. So a lot of the artists uh, were dealing with references to nature, but how that became manifested in their work uh, varied from artist to artist. Uh, some were more realistic, some of their work was more uh, refined in a sense, while others were uh, uh, looser in their approach uh, in building their work. Uh, so uh, Again, my goal was to try to present the strongest group of work in a broad sweep uh, to demonstrate what artists uh, that are using paper clay are producing. And it was interesting, uh, a number of the artists whose work I've known for years, I had no idea they were using paper clay. So uh, two examples or three is uh, Matt Waddell's work. Uh, Matt's from, I think, Ohio. Uh, Christina Cordova from North Carolina, and uh, Shawan Yu, who was a grad student at ASU when I was at the Ceramic Research Center. Loved her work, still love her work, but I didn't have a clue that she was using paper clay, and you should be ashamed that you didn't tell me. <laughs> anyway, um, the other sort of factor that I... In, include in my curation is uh, having a mix of both emerging artists and more established artists. Uh, so uh, I think that goal was achieved and I know there was uh, several artists including Shawan, uh, Stephanie H Haynes and uh, Yirim uh, Lee. Uh, who had just uh, in the last three years, three or four years have graduated from uh, graduate school. So they were young artists just starting out. And I was uh, very pleased to be able to include them in their work. And uh, since that time, they, their careers have really blossomed. Uh, Shawan just had an exhibition at Sherry Leedy Contemporary Art in Kansas City. Uh, Stephanie Haynes is now teaching at the University of Washington. And uh, Yurim, uh, I think, just had a solo exhibition uh, in Korea. So uh, I'm pleased that you know we were able to include artists that are just starting their career and hopefully being part of the particle and wave exhibition was a contributing factor. Uh, another aspect that I uh, <clears throat> Included in my thinking is a gender balance uh, as far as having uh, representation uh, of women artists, which are sometimes excluded uh, from exhibitions. I think there's been a vast uh, reawakening of that issue of late. Uh, but it was interesting out of the artists in the exhibition, almost uh, three quarters of the artists are in fact uh, women artists. And uh, maybe during a Q&A session, someone has a perspective on why that might be. Uh, because generally uh, with these group exhibitions, especially juried ones, uh, the ratio of between male and female or is at times skewed. Uh, I think those are all the points I wanted to touch on. Uh, as I said, it was a great opportunity for me to learn more about the paper clay process as well as being exposed to uh, artists I was unfamiliar with uh, from all around the world. 
and uh, it's really been a great experience. And again, uh, my gratitude to Lori and the advisory committee that sort of guided me throughout the whole process. So I'll leave it at that and wait for any questions you might have. I did see one question in the chat that maybe one of the artists can answer, and that's, um, please tell us a bit about the physical properties of paper clay and how it impacts the work. So I think that that's, and that's the question that I think, you know, I've heard the most is kind of why, right. why paper clay and, and what is it about it that keeps drawing artists in? Well, I think originally, and I'll let the individual artists all have their own reasons for, uh, for using paper clay or how they discovered paper clay. But um, I think at first, um, a lot of artists use it because it solved problems. Problems with, with cracking, for example. Um, but as it started to become used uh, more prevalently, what it, because of the way that paper clay performs, um, it allows them to push the boundaries, you know, because in the, the fibers in the clay are like little tubes and they absorb the water. And so it's easier, you know, the clay can be very lightweight, very translucent, um, and it's easier for them to lock and it allows you to, to expand out and to do uh, very unusual things without the traditional breaking and problems that you have with traditional clay. But I'm going to turn it over to some of the artists to talk about why they use paper clay. Well, I was, uh, this is Jerry Bennett. I was, I was just going to kind of quickly define paper clay a little bit. Uh, paper clay basically is ceramic clay, usually in its raw state, that has as cellulose-based fibers that are added to it. And an example of cellulose fibers would be paper, of course, but it could be uh, jute, it could be cotton. I use a lot of cotton in my clay. Um, abaca is another really kind of uh, innovative material you can add to it. All these are cellulose-based fibers. And after the first firing or the bis firing of the piece, the, the paper fibers burn out. And one of the differences between regular clay and paper clay is the most fragile time for paper clay is in the bis state, not in the raw state. In the raw state, clay, uh, paper clay is very strong. It's almost cement-like, it's extremely strong. So on, on looking at these uh, pictures of this exhibition, these really large pieces, these fragile pieces made out of paper clay become much stronger, easier to move in and out of the kill, easier to support themselves. It's uh, much easier to work with. Uh, I, I completely agree with the idea that the reason to use paper clay is nothing miraculous other than the fact it's easier and it solves problems. Um, the other thing about paper clay that's really kind of amazing is that you can repair pieces very easily. The other thing with students that I talk about is the fact that pieces are really never really done. Um, usually in ceramics, there's a step-by-step -step process that up to the point of what we call late leather hard or the beginning of the drying of the project, um, then all work really needs to stop. It gets fired and it's sort of frozen in time. It's gonna be what it's gonna be. But in paper clay, you can continue to add things to it. You can continue to look at it. If something cracks or falls off, you can put it back on. It's really quite an amazing material. And it's really changed slowly but surely. It's really changing the way ceramicists look at the, the medium of ceramics because of these changes. Um, one of the other, the final thing I'll say is that um, I have students that have, have really never used anything but paper clay. And when they go into another class that is not using paper clay, I have to have my, my ceramic discussion with them and say, now, you know, the rules are changing here. You can't do this and you can't do that. And it's, uh, it's always kind of surprising that, um, you know, regular ceramics lives with one set of rules, paper clay lives with another. 
Jerry, do you work exclusively with paper clay? Yes, I do. You do. Yeah. And I, I use um, a combination of Abaca um, at a rate of about four ounces per 25 pounds of clay, just as a rough idea. And then to that, sometimes if I'm doing more sculptural work, I'll actually put a little cotton, long fiber cotton in it. The, the advances that are going on in, in paper clay right now are sort of um, developments in the idea of, of combinations of different fibers to add to it. And that's the, now that's my interpretation of it. The people may disagree with that, but it seems to be that there's a lot of awakening on the different properties of different fibers. To jump on to your point um, about the work never being done, uh, Jerry, uh, I want to point out that with paper clay, there, there are a lot of artists who never fire it because it's so strong in that greenware state. Um, there are examples that we couldn't put in the show because it's a traveling exhibition and we are limited by size. But um, there, there are examples of very large sculptural works uh, that are merely sealed to keep the moisture out. And in fact, when we were at, at the second symposium uh, in Keshkemit, Hungary, they brought out uh, a piece that was done uh, at the previous symposium on paper clay that was 10 years old and it was still strong together. Uh, pretty amazing. Um, the, the piece was by Melanie Peterson. Yeah, Mel Melanie Peterson. And then, uh, yeah. but we have uh, someone here tonight, Rebecca Hutchinson who does a lot of work with both fired and unfired uh, paper clay. Not to put you on the spot, Rebecca, but would you like to say a few things? So Lori mentioned that um, I use paper clay in an unfired uh, method, and that's true. I am assembling all my pieces uh, with what I would call Adobe, air dried, air dried paper clay. And as we know, Adobe is used around the world because it's very strong. As Jerry mentioned, it's incredibly strong, almost cement-like with up to 40% fibers. And that is, um, what I'm doing is not unlike what artisans are doing around the world, albeit in Africa, Thailand, Mexico, in mixing, uh, in their cases, by village, indigenous fibers or that which is the vernacular, that which is a place mixed in with the clay. So grasses and haze, even though it's not pulped down, it is still cellulose and that's mixed into the clay. I, I'm also using Adobe to assemble my pieces um, and I am taking cellulose and, and beating it. I'm actually beating all fibers and a Hollander beater because I also have the love of paper making. And so um, I'm actually then processing my own cellulose fibers in the Hollander beater. Sometimes it is um, collected harvested materials such as flax that I can grow. Other times it's harvested from culture and I'm actually literally going to Goodwill and I'm collecting blue jeans and linen tablecloths and, and cutting them up and putting them in the Hollander beater and pulping. But the pulp is mixed with clay. And for me, it's about 30% cellulose and 70% clay. And then I also use an adhesive um, with my paper clay. And that is anything that's water soluble but uh, for me, I have a preference of either using a white Elmer's glue or a wallpaper paste. When people do large commissions in Adobe, they often use something uh, like a cement sealer or a Portland cement or something like that. The, the Adobe is just simply air dried paper clay. And I use that terminology all the time is when it's not um, routed for the kiln, I will call it Adobe so that I'm mindful of uh, my teaching methods. If I'm teaching with students or in my own making um, that, that there are pieces that I'm making that are not intended for the kiln. And then there are certainly paper clay pieces 
that I am making for the kiln. And then for me, everything's an assemblage method. I am surrounded by hundreds of parts that I've made and I'm assembling by dipping into this Adobe mixture, paper clay plus adhesive. And there you're seeing image sage is frozen there of my piece that's in the exhibition that, that Peter chose. And it's just uh, multiple parts dipped into an Adobe mixture and stuck onto a willow frame. The willow's harvested from my property. So very much connected to harvesting and the concept of harvesting, not only organic materials, but also cultural cast off materials. Somebody just asked about color. Uh, color can be mixed into the clay body through mason stain or uh, oxides, and others might like to talk about this. Color can also be applied to paper clay uh, surfaces. So all of your ceramic knowledge just follows suit with paper clay. So under glazes and then glazes um, can apply color. You're seeing both color in my piece um, from a variety of methods. I'm mixing colorants into the clay so that some of the pieces are actually colored clay. And then you're also seeing parts that are glazed. And then you're also seeing where you see soft edges in the piece, you're actually seeing 100% handmade paper. So I I'm actually mixing handmade paper with the paper clay objects. One other aspect uh, that I found interesting was uh, issues of sustainability, using recycled material, upcycling. And I know in talking uh, with Graham and I believe Anjani, like in India and Australia, the majority of artists, uh, ceramic artists in those countries are using paper clay. It just has a, a different profile in the US. So if there's anyone that wants to talk about sustainability issues or how that factors into their work. Somebody uh, made a comment about, uh, they were looking at Rebecca and Jerry's work and how delicate it, it looks. Um, and this gets back to how strong it is in the greenware state. Um, and you can work very, very thin. There's some beautiful examples of translucent pieces in this show. So um, somebody else asked about what a Hollander beater is. A Hollander beater is a paper maker's beater. Uh, its name is of course, because it was uh, invented in Holland uh, early on, even, even around the Delf, Delft wear time, the blue and white wear time. So we're talking late 1700s, early 1800s. It is um, a, a cog wheel that's powered by a motor and the cellulose fibers forced through a circular vat of water underneath a cog wheel and a bed plate. And it basically pounds the fiber. It's not a cutting process. That's why we always encourage uh, staying away from uh, uh, like a traditional kitchen mixer because that cuts the fiber, but rather beats the fiber. So it elongates and swells with water so that you have you know, maximum strength to mix in with clay. Um, as Jerry and Rebecca used to tell me when we uh, did those series of workshops, I tend to, uh, I need to speak up when talking to people in America. Um, Rebecca sort of uh, leads to that sort of the point that we're talking about processed cellulose fiber. So you can't just add straw. And that was the big breakthrough. Uh, in the 60s, um, people added all sorts of things, fiberglass, paper, whatever, but they didn't process it. They didn't separate the individual fibers. And what Rebecca's talking about is a really important part of that. The interesting thing, though, is that from the very beginning, um, the invention in across four countries of paper clay almost at the same time, it's all a lot of them had connections to the paper making community like Rebecca. Um, and because of that connection of the paper making community, a lot of the early um, paper clay art had referencing paper art. So the forms were book forms, or you can see even the work in the top left hand corner, uh, quite thin sheets used, um, which moved away from the more the mass focus in ceramics. So we're talking about a, a blending of aesthetics between paper and clay, not just a technical combination. 
and the other thing too is that it tended to be, based on my experience at Serrano and Old Workshops, tend to be most the beginning ceramic practitioners, people entering ceramics, or people who've been doing it for many decades who become frustrated with the limitations of material and they want to expand their ideas and go further. And so what we looked at is, um, and Rosette will, will probably back me up on this one, is we found that there was a, as a freeing up that the adding of the paper to, to the clay offered not only a technical aspect, but uh, artistically. And we, st we started to see a lot more thinner works, more delicate, longer pieces and so on, which now has fed into the, the orthodox ceramics community, even people who are not using paper clay, without realizing that a lot of the work that they saw early on, very thin pieces, was actually paper clay using that dry strength. It's a bit like adding steel rods to concrete. Concrete is great load bearing vertical, but horizontal is not very strong. You put steel rods through it. And the same with paper clay, adding the fibers. When it dried, the clay shrunk around the wood fibers. So like wooden beans in a sense, and that's the clay so you could do build it. The other thing too, like Rebecca's work combining fired and unfired work, uh, a lot of people played that idea that you could either move completely to unfired or a work with fired paper clay, or you could do the combination between them. And that's the, the cutting edge um, where we're, we're uh, for example, had a discussion about uh, doing a workshop yesterday and the, it's a ceramics group that's been there for 50 years and they're wanting to move towards the unfired, some of the new members, but it takes, it takes a generation or two or three generation change of office holders for those, those ideas to come through. And, uh, you know, we see that, for example, in Australia, um, I live on the West Coast, like California versus New York, Queensland, uh, Sydney, Melbourne. And I used to do workshops for three or four years. And the people coming from pottery clubs found it really hard to take that technology back. There's a resistance to the technology, but when an office holders changed, the new ones were open to it, understood paper clay, so it wasn't a threat. And suddenly it went through those communities and they started inviting me to fly across and do workshops. So the same thing is happening in the States. You, you, I always define the America as like a huge ship, straight as a small boat, and you, you happen much slower. You've got a very strong traditional uh, wood firing, studio potter traditions and so on. So it takes a long time for newer generations to learn new processes and take those forward. And we're seeing the aesthetic imp impact of paper clay far outside the community actually using paper clay and the content and the way that it's used. So I think that's the sort of the takeaway message, I suppose. That's my bit. We have quite a few other artists here. Uh, you talk about new generation and people who have been working with the material for a long time. Would uh, anyone like to, anyone else like to talk about their work or their process? And maybe we can get some more images up here, maybe find some images of your work um, if that's possible. So you can talk about it a little bit. Hello, this is Susan Collette from Toronto. Hi, everybody. Um, I, uh, I employ the paper clay because I use a nichrome wire, a canthal wire as a substructure in my work. So I use it as a drawing line because I come from a tradition of printmaking. I, I actually came very late to clay in my last year of my BFA. So uh, the, the paper clay is excellent because it, it hangs on to the wire quite well and provides a lot of strength and allows me to get a very awkward piece to the kiln safely. Uh, and then my glaze process is multi-firing many times to build up a patina or a history uh, for the piece. And that's why I get that real acidic green in this particular piece. It's from many, many layers um, back into the kiln. And I don't use it exclusively. I also work with porcelain for other transparent uh, qualities that I can get um, from the paper clay. So yeah, you can, there's a wire uh, underneath there um, and I build and I actually fire it and I build on it again and then I turn it and then I add more clay, fire it again, turn it so that I, so that it never lands. It's, it's, it's a perpetually moving, floating, falling forward. I try to get a lot of movement into the work and the wire is, is um, underneath holding that, that drawing together. So yeah, I love paper clay, it's fabulous, yeah. Thank you. I love the colors, the colors in your work, Susan. And I'm wondering, are you using underglazes or how are you bringing that color into your work? Uh, yes, I am using underglaze 
in the purple so that it's more natural and actually like even though it comes across rather floral it's like crumpled paper it's like things that are gathered in the in your journey and uh so i use a dry colored effect in contrast to the more satiny waxy glaze of the green so i mix yes use underglaze overglaze stains uh, oh and then also there are droplets of water there's like small bead like water droplets and i then do a mother of pearl final firing very low um, cone 022 you know to get that nice luster of a water droplet within that dry paper purple crumpling so it's a mix of things yes anyone else want to ask a question or say something about their work okay um i'm lisa nelson and um yeah, it's interesting to hear Susan talk about building on top of her work um, and firing and building again, because that's something that I kind of discovered a while ago. I originally started working with paper clay as a way to be able to um, take a solid object. Like a, I was really interested in burnouts. So um, I wanted to be able to take like a stick or some kind of organic form from nature and be able to just dip it and have the shape, but with the kind of fluidity of the drip. And um, so I started creating these um, forms that were solid objects dipped in clay that had burned out that became these very like beautiful kind of thin shell like or bone like things. And then I discovered that, you know, just from working with it, all the properties of, of like its ability to just um, kind of ad adapt and not crack and break off even with like a lot of shrinkage around another object and um or you know being added to something and i could i discovered i could add like chunks of hand-built pieces onto the dipped things and then i started to do what susan was talking about where i would be adding on top of and building on top of structures that were already fired and it became a way for me to like I've always been really a salvager, like really interested in, in garbage or found objects or kind of little experimental things. And paper clay gave me a way to um, put fired work that didn't turn out or I wasn't happy with um, to kind of like renew its life or give combine it with something else and create a new sculpture of parts of failed other things or broken things. And, uh, or to create a veneer over the, of clay over the top of like a glaze that I didn't like, but then the clay would sort of crack and the glaze would come from underneath. So it really, for me, created um, all, um, just the whole world of possibilities of exploration that clay would, um, I tried with regular clay at first, some of those things and just, I got frustrated because it would like break and fall off and the whole thing would just be a pile. And so paper clay, was able to kind of like rescue those experiments and they would stay intact. And um, so it's been a really exciting, continually experimental thing for me to, to work with, so. And I had a question for any of the artists that are here that work in both paper clay and more traditional clay bodies and what kind of the, the decision-making process is when they're deciding which one to use. Like, is there a time where you wouldn't want to use paper clay and you kind of veer towards more traditional clay. Um, I'll speak to that. This is Mimi. I do both functional work with um, thrown porcelain and then I do hand-built paper clay work. Um, so all of my hand-built work is with paper clay and the hand-built work can either be um, super thin like those, uh, like the sculpture I have in this show to actually imitate rice paper so they look like, I mean, it really is thin. You can see your hand through it. Those are lights at the, <laughs> the yellow bit is light. Um, but I also just do um, very traditional thrown um, uh, plates, bowls, all that sort of stuff. So you don't, I didn't, I don't want all that paper when I'm trimming and things like that. So that can get in the way. And I also do really large uh, hand-built things, um, which I use paper with. And I tried the other day, I said, you know what? <laughs> let, me just, let me just test this. <laughs> because after working with something for so long, you just started 
you kind of take it for granted. So I made this giant platter that's kind of hollow form and built in a mold and uh, all of this. And I was like, oh man, porcelain is so beautiful. And it was so fun to work with. And there was no fibers getting pulled anywhere. And then I looked at it a couple of days later and I had, you know, it was all propped and covered and drying slowly. And there were cracks all over it. So I was like, there it is. <laughs> That's it, no more. <laughs> so yeah, paper clay really does allow that porcelain to be, uh, you know, put together and dried horizontally and without all that compression of throwing, I guess is really, I don't, I don't know exactly. I don't know enough about it uh, chemically, but I know it works now and I'm not gonna test it anymore. <laughs> Mimi, this one of the things about your piece is it's it's kind of deceptive for people looking at it. Yeah. Uh, but for those who are looking at it right now, it is extremely thin. Yeah. And, and translucent. Um, it's, it's really beautiful. Thank you. And how do you do the imagery that are on the surface? They're really fascinating. Thank you. So that's a process that's printed onto the wet clay and it's a Without making a silk screen, I use a Xerox, but it's like a, it, as far as I know, I'm the only person that does it. And, and uh, but maybe people here know what this is, but uh, it's sort of been my sort of secret process, but it's like a, you take a Xerox and you reverse it and um, you, uh, it's mason stain. So that's brushed on and where it's paper, it sucks into the paper and where the ink is of the Xerox, it resists. So I just assemble images. I, it's like very old school, cutting, cutting it out, uh, laying it down and building up the surface. So it's like making an old uh, fanzine kind of from my early days of being a little punk rock kid. <laughs> <laughs> so it speaks to me. Is Anjani here? I've been trying to contact her because we had communication yesterday. She thought right. it was on yesterday, but um, I've WhatsApped her, but I'm not getting an answer. So I'm not sure whether she's going to be here one today or not. Uh, I can share a little bit. Okay. Does she in here? Oh, good. Thanks for organizing the beautiful show and uh, special thanks to Rebecca. Uh, actually, I learned my paper clay technique from her uh, a couple of years ago at the workshop in Aramount uh, in my second year in grad school, I think. Mm -hmm. So uh, before uh, I started using paper clay, uh, I was mainly using porcelain to make my work. And my work is very uh, organic structural light work inspired by the microscopic uh, organi uh, organisms. So it's really frustrating to see all those cracks showing up and uh, those kind of drives me crazy. So uh, learning paper clay uh, kind of made my studio life much, much easier. And it's been a couple of years now using paper clay, but I'm still learning it uh, like I've, every day, I feel like. And I really uh, enjoy using paper clay because it really helped me to solve those technical uh, problems. And my process is uh, starting from smaller, uh, like a centerpiece is a small uh, hollow structure and then uh, with stuffed with some newspaper and then uh, building on top of the surface and then flip the piece to make it uh, three dimensional. So it's like flick a flip back and forth, back and forth a couple of times, like more than a couple of times to finish uh, the whole piece. Mm -hmm. And then for this uh, type of work, I also do a lot of firings on my uh, glaze. So uh, it's hard to see here. So I use a very heavy texture glaze. And every time I spray the glaze on the surface and fire it, and then um, do it again, 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 like it can fire up to over 10 times as well. So it's also a very uh, time consuming process. 
uh, for the uh, glazing part. But for me, it's like an organism like involving in some way. So it's labor intense, but I guess I enjoy doing that. <laughs> yeah. We have a question. Can you fire pieces in an electric kiln? This I fire my piece in the electronic kiln. I've been firing for 20 years, electric kiln. The other thing too is with paper clay, the option of, uh, although it's available in the general ceramics community in certain parts of single glaze firing. So make it work dry it, glaze it, then fire it single firing, just reduce your carbon footprint. Oh, can someone uh, speak about the name particle and wave? Where'd that come from? Uh, that came from um, the properties of light. In fact, uh, initially, uh, I, I was exposed to a lot of different work where people were working very thin. And again, you see some examples in this exhibition. And um, not only for work that's very thin, but for really uh, how the light uh, passes through a piece. And when you look at uh, study light, uh, it's actually a particle and a wave. And so that's how I came up with the title for the exhibition. And I think everything um, has a relationship to light, whether it's translucent or not. Yeah, it was interesting curating the show. Uh, you know, some of the work is delicate and fragile and has a translucent quality. Uh, while other artists are uh, working with larger masses. So uh, as an example, uh, means figurative work, you know, work like uh, Christina Cordova uh, isn't about translucency or fragility. Uh, so again, it's just uh, was amazing to me, the various approaches and uh, different aesthetic qualities that uh, artists were achieving. Uh, with the material. Unfortunately, I, think I don't know. So. I think some people have done it. Um, there's a there's an artist in Turkey that has been working with that. So and Graham's done a little bit of work with that. Uh, it's just uh, getting the right mix and texture to get it to do what you need it to do within that framework. Correct. The, the key point is uh, you're pushing um, clay, which is quite made of little rocks, so it's quite, quite abrasive through a very mm -hmm. fine point. And secondly, mm -hmm. if you're adding cellulose fiber to it, if we're using paper fiber, which is long, like a loose straw, it mm -hmm. tends to block it. So um, uh, I connected with some of the Italians playing with this area and they found a perfect solution, which was instead of using water in your clay to use olive oil, which is a perfect Italian solution. Um, mm -hmm. And um, I successfully converted a 3D printer from printing plastic to paper clay. But we, what we got around that problem, the fiber is using flour, um, which is ground up cellulose fiber. So that's something, a bit of a starting point for those out there that are interested in that area. Um, there are other uh, works being done, not necessarily with paper clay, uh, but with a similar idea of mixing clay with other objects that then burn out in the kiln and that's a mm -hmm. deliberate technique and not to say that you don't do that with paper clay as well i mean it, there's mm -hmm. there's no uh no rhyme or reason to go one way or the other except that you know you're with paper clay uh, again you, you're using it uh for its greenware strength um so that's kind of an interesting uh there's a lot of work uh there's some a book uh also that's talking about additives to clay and the interesting effects that you can get from it so mm. another area this is something kind of interesting that's <clears throat> a research uh thing that's new to me and probably other people have tried it but um you know, in, in having the idea to put objects together or fired things and use paper clay to bind them. 
um, I've also been able, I've been working on a recipe to, for repairs for, for um, like China or other things. And I've, um, I have found a recipe that's a low fire, actually it's a low fire um, self glazing clay body that is from, it's out of the Val Cushing handbook. Um, but because it's self glazing and it's low fire, it can be used to repair almost any even like factory fired things that have broken and the paper gives it the stability and you know the fibers to be able um to be able to like have stability while it's green so that it doesn't just crumble apart as you're like moving it into the kiln and then the clay uh gives it like the structure but then the self-glazing aspect actually centers and binds the things together. So it's like, a, it's like Kintsuki kind of, um, or for those of you who may not be familiar with Kintsuki is a, um, I believe it's Japanese um, mm -hmm. method of using resin um, and to repair ceramics. And then they do like gold over the top. Um, or maybe they mix the gold in. I'm not an expert on Kintsuki, but it's the similar concept of using this other material to bind and repair mm -hmm. things. So I haven't totally perfected that yet. I've gotten some, like a little bit of um, a gap that happens. So I'll often have to fire things like a couple of times and just keep filling in the little cracks that form. But I'm hoping to like refine the recipe to get it to be just like a really nice kind of one fire, once fire like repair method. So that there's a lot of potential maybe in the future of that kind of research. So what can I ask a question to the group as well? Like, or to any artists working with paper clay, are there like anyone who's worked with it kind of we see these this broad range of possibilities with the material, right? So like are there any weird experimental things that have or haven't worked or like people who've started to try something that has come upon like a interesting direction or like a new research maybe direction oh it's susan in Toronto. um i've been i use a cake decorator um and have the paper clay in that so that then i can use it as a drawing material again relating to my printmaking and so I can draw with the clay onto newspaper and then lift that up and fire that and I can have writing like I can have it fine and uh, I can I can write and I'm incorporating that into new works so you can really push it to, and it still holds its strength the paper still holds it and then I'm firing it on a piece of newsprint so that whole the paper burns away in the kiln and you're left with with some filigree work which I've been incorporating into some new pieces I've been um, experimenting with uh, uh, some sculptural pieces that I'm actually glazing in the kill. And I do it as a dry powder that is basically sprinkled over the top. And then I basically take paper that's underneath it and remove it so that it's sort of like a spreading technique. But it's not technically paper clay, but I don't think I would do that with anything other than paper clay. But there's just you know i run into students all the time and it never surprises me just how crazy I, i've got a student that likes to throw regular pots so it's sort of like vase shapes and her father is um uh, into like digging up very ancient pots and stuff that are all broken so she'll take and and crack the bisqueware apart and then stick it back together with slip different colored slip. And uh, you would think that that would be a risky thing, but of all the pieces that she's ever made, I've never seen it not work. <laughs> so it's, uh, you know, well, been, a thrill I've, out of it. <laughs> I've been doing some experimentation too, uh, similar to what you're talking about, Jerry, and uh, um, creating uh, mini landscapes, if you will, uh, starting with a base of paper clay but also um, using cellulose powder mixed with uh, powdered porcelain. And I mix them 50-50. And uh, in addition to dipping things and then to, to create, help to create these landscapes, um, you know how you have those little 
uh, not a sifter, but a, a mesh that, oh, traditionally you put powdered sugar in it and you just tap it over the top of a cake or something like that. So I put that stuff that in there and I start building up and then adding more to it, building up. And then um, just lightly mist it with water. So it's a long process, but if you keep letting it dry, wet it, letting it dry, adding more layers, uh, eventually it just builds up, builds up, builds up. And it's really an interesting effect. Um, the other thing that I'm interested in, in experimenting with is mycelium. Uh, I've seen some people who are uh, putting organic matter in like those little cotton tubes like you put for your um, a cast uh, and then growing the mushrooms on it and then the mycelium uh, goes in through the whole thing and creates this very, very strong structure much like paper clay creates a very long, you know, strong structure with its fibers. And, um, you know, I think it'd be interesting to, to uh, explore the possibility of using, uh, again, fired, non-fired paper clay with other organic ways of building. Uh, and actually, um, I have, I got the idea from uh, a website, uh, that actually was talking about building structures uh, from growing the mycelium on, on a base, like cotton base, mm -hmm. and let it grow and giving it some food inside, you know, stuffing it with organic matter. Um, it's really amazing, you know, when you get that kind of strength going on and Anyway, I think it'd be fun to, and interesting. I haven't tried uh, the mycelium yet, but I, uh, I think it's worth exploring. If we're winding down, I might just play some more slides for us as we kind of end this evening. Um, I wanna thank everybody for being here together across uh, the nation, across all corners of the world. Um, you know, I'm, I'm very grateful to be able to still present what's going on at Fuller Craft Museum despite closures and ongoing um, restrictions and all that that's going on right now. Um, so again, thank you again on behalf of Fuller Craft Museum. Please check our website for upcoming events. Great, thanks. I think we're gonna close it up. Um, thanks again for everyone being here tonight stay safe, stay healthy. I look forward to seeing some of you in person in the near future, and maybe some of you will meet up in the future as well. Thanks again. Take care. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.